Good afternoon and welcome to the first of four sessions as part of the What Works Festival of Learning. This is now the second year of the series which is all about sharing knowledge and ideas, discussing best practices in the area of prevention and early intervention while keeping us curious as professionals when it comes to the lives of children and their families. Now, What Works is an initiative designed by the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth, and it's funded through the Dormant Accounts. The theme of this year's festival is Fairer Futures. And over the next two weeks, we're going to explore a range of topics, starting first today with perspectives on disadvantage, how inequality concerns everyone. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about mitigating disadvantage through public policy. Next week, we'll have two webinars, Monday and Wednesday again, making connections or digitally divided disadvantage in the digital world. And that final session will be on how can the EU prioritise the needs of children and young people. Today, as we say, we're focused on the topic of disadvantage and inequality. And we really hope today's session for the next hour marks an opportunity for all of you joining us here today to take stock and really reflect and understand how a global pandemic, this once in a century lifetime event, has widened the gaps and worsened some of the problems encountered by children and their families. We have a stellar panel joining us today who are going to bring their unique perspectives, experience and thoughts on this topic. Now we do recognise there's a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different experiences that come into play when it comes to this issue. We're going to do our best to try and explore as many of these experiences and perspectives this week over all of the sessions. You're going to hear shortly from the amazing Professor Kate Pickett uh, from University of York, the co-author of the Spirit Level and the Inner Level. You're going to hear also from Bernie Laver National ABC Manager at Tusla, the Child and Family Agency, and also from Emer Smith, Research Professor at the ESRI. Unfortunately, Owen Ward, Traveller Education Officer with NUI Galway, can't be with us for the discussion today. We're also delighted to be joined by Irish Sign Language Interpreter Bernadette Ferguson. Now, over the course of the next hour, we hope to provide you our audience with a better understanding of the impact inequality is having in our society in terms of poverty, adversity, exclusion and so, so much more and how really we need to go about tackling this and what more is ultimately needed. We really encourage all of you watching this live stream today to come with your questions, your feedback throughout this conversation. You can do that by simply going to the little speech bubble that you'll see at the right hand corner of your screen in there throughout this conversation for the next hour. Come in there with your questions. We're going to be monitoring them in real time and making sure we're weaving them into the conversation. And the more we hear from you, our audience, uh, to inform this conversation, the better. So we really encourage that. We'd also love to hear from you on social media and really draw attention to the incredible work everybody is doing here by using the hashtag Fairer Futures across all social media platforms. Now, to get us started, we have a very, very simple poll that we'd love for all of you to engage in, just to give us a sense of who is joining us today. If you head down to the little pie chart icon, it's going to be down there beside that speech bubble down at the bottom right hand corner of your screen you're going to see a little poll top uh, pop up hopefully that's simply asking the question tell us about yourself and what brings you here today and hopefully you're going to see a number of options there uh, frontline services uh, so you might be a youth worker a social worker or a teacher um, you might be from research academia you might be somebody who's a policy maker, so you're working in a government department or a state agency. You might be somebody from an advocacy organization or an NGO, or you might not be from any of that. You're just really interested in this topic. So give us a sense of who you are, because I think this will really help all of our speakers today uh, to get a sense of who is joining us. Give us a flavor for how they can uh, target some of their, their thoughts and considerations. So definitely we've got... Uh, NGO advocacy coming in top there. We've got some policymakers. Other, we're going to assume people interested. Uh, research academia is out on top now. Thank you for joining us. Frontline services, policymakers. So we definitely research academia out in front, and we've got a nice equal distribution then 
between and frontline services have come to the top that's great to see it is so great to have all of you so frontline services followed by research academia um are our our predominant audience today so thank you for that that gives our audience a really good sense of who is with us today now without any further delay to get us started we're joined by kate pickett who is currently professor of epidemiology in the department of health sciences at york university and the university's research champion for just Justice and equality. She is co-author with Richard Wilkinson of The Spirit Level and many of you will be familiar with this incredible 2009 book. I'm sure it's on many of your bookshelves at home and I hope many of you will be reaching for it tonight as you reflect on this conversation because that book is more relevant than ever before and I had the pleasure of dipping back into it last night. Keish, you are so welcome. Thank you for joining us. After the last 19 months that we have had as a society globally, can you reflect a little bit on just where the divisions, gaps you feel have even widened? Whatever about the state of our world pre-COVID, what does it look like now as we're starting to get to grips and do a post-mortem? Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I'm not sure we're quite at the post-mortem stage yet. You know, we're still very much in this pandemic and if we look across the world of course different countries are at different stages of that and it's, it's important to remember that we're not in a post-pandemic world yet um, and we don't quite know what that will look like but we have had 18 19 months of experience of this pandemic and of course the main thing it's shown us i think is it's highlighted how entrenched those inequalities were already in our society you know we we had great inequalities of wealth of income of power inequalities of health and educational outcome um and what the pandemic has done is sharpen those it's exacerbated them it's widened those gaps um inequality tells us a lot about the kind of pandemic we have had and have been having, who was vulnerable, who was most exposed, who was least able to protect themselves and their loved ones, um, who was going to be more sick if they got infected, who was more likely to die. So all of the inequalities that were affecting us in society have been highlighted and sort of amplified by the pandemic. And so there are lots of sort of salient lessons to draw from our understanding of inequality and, and how it affects health and social outcomes in the context of the pandemic. Um, but it leaves us with a bigger job to do to tackle those inequalities. We had entrenched and intersecting inequalities before. Now they're a bit worse and there's this bigger job to do to create a fairer future and build back better. And when you think there of that further entrenchment and how this has become even widened, further amplified, who exactly do you think are the communities? And I take your point, we're not yet in a post-pandemic world, so we're only of this moment and our, the story has only come so far, but who do you think are the communities worst affected? Um, I think children are probably, children and young people are those who are going to be most impacted because they're being affected now they've been affected throughout the pandemic but there will be lifelong effects for them um short-term medium long-term effects for our children and young people of having gone through this pandemic so children and young people saw their lives change drastically with covid um, schools closed they were home for some children, that was a refuge from school that had been a place of, of discomfort or bullying or, or, or difficulty. But for others, um, it meant that they were at home without, without their refuge in school or being supported. Their learning was affected. Their families' livelihoods were affected. Parents' mental health was affected. Children and young people's mental health was affected. So they've been profoundly affected in material ways, in psychological ways, in educational and learning and developmental ways. You know, our children um, were suddenly thrown back on, on the nuclear family for a lot of the time um, and were missing their peers and missing their normal social and community engagements. 
and that's that's a big shock in a child's life and for us as adults it's felt like a long time hasn't it you know we, it feels like we've been in this pandemic for a long time but for adults it's just a fraction of our life and for children you know it's a huge part for some children because it's all of their lives have been spent in in this very different and socially sort of restricted kind of world so children and young people i think are are very vulnerable and people living in deprived communities people living in um, communities or in groups that were already experiencing the sharp end of inequality they're the ones who will feel the impact of the pandemic most and when you describe all of that case you know the learning the mental health issues the the lack of social connection and as you say there's going to be repercussions for for decades probably for children young people and we often then talk about all of those factors and variables and we talk about inequality we talk about disadvantage and i wonder sometimes does that feel a little bit removed from everyday people and do we have to talk about this issue in a different way like is, is sometimes our definitions and labels wrong and we're not sometimes galvanizing the public and ensuring that we're getting the advocate adequate supports and resources to help in moments like this well, I think you always need a combination, don't you, of statistics and stories mm -hmm. um, to to really understand how big social or environmental changes or cultural changes or shocks to the system affect individual lives. Um, for some people, being shown data is what convinces them that something needs to change. So sometimes you can talk to policymakers and politicians and practitioners using data, using facts to, to create opportunities for change. But more often, I'd say it's narratives, it's stories, it's understanding what, what those statistics tell you, um, using them as a lens to look at sections of society or look at the experiences of different groups of people and then bring those to life. We need stories that sort of bring the numbers to life i mean i think in my own work i always want it to be um consistent of robust research you know rigorous research but then i want to communicate it in ways that are enriched with the stories of people's lives so that the data do come alive yeah and i think we need to find multiple ways to engage with different kinds of audiences around these issues and always be thinking about what what we need to communicate and how we need to engage people but everybody in ireland has gone through this pandemic everybody has got some experience now of of what it has meant to them and so probably we've got opportunities here that perhaps we didn't have before when people felt that they were doing okay or it was other people's lives that 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 needed adjustment and not theirs i, I think we've been through something collectively mm that should give us a shared language and has, has done a, a lot to show us structural problems or difficulties that, that we could address together. So I think this is an opportunity for, for change in a positive way and, and we shouldn't only see it as a, a terrible thing that has happened but something that gives us an impetus towards positive change. And I wonder when you reflect back in 2009 when you wrote The Spirit Level, that was coming out the back of recession, you know, job losses, world economy was really suffering. And there was an opportunity in that moment, I'd like to think, you know, and we were all having this conversation then, and you were able to show in The Spirit Level back, that's what, 12 years ago, inequality causes shorter, unhealthier, unhappier lives, increases the rate of teenage pregnancy, violence, obesity, imprisonment, addiction. You were able to kind of show all of this. In between, we've lurched from one crisis to another, a pandemic, climate change, Brexit, so many other things in between. And I wonder, at the end of that, that the spirit level, there was a sense of hopefulness that change was possible. And I wonder, did any of that change take place? Did we seize an opportunity back in 2009 and make some changes before this pandemic? Or are we really still looking to seize a moment, an opportunity, but coming still from a very low base? I'm afraid we are still coming from a pretty low base. So we did not um, collectively throughout the world make the most of the opportunities that the global financial crisis created. 
the global financial crisis showed us a lot of what was wrong with with systems um, and a lot of the problems that are arising from time i think a lot of will change now you know this this will be a crisis moment that, that leads to really positive change it wasn't and in fact it led to policies in many countries um that reversed progress that had previously been made in reducing inequalities and improving things um, for people's lives in the uk for example we embarked on a decade of austerity which actually worsened health and social problems so that we entered the pandemic in a worse state than we had been at the time of the global financial crisis in terms of our life expectancy, our infant mortality and other indicators. So we did not make the most of that opportunity, but perhaps that along with the pandemic, those become the salient lessons for us in this moment. You know, this is our time for change. This is, this is the moment we must seize because we can look back and reflect on how we could have done things better at that crisis um, and perhaps we can do better this time i do i i stay optimistic because i do think there is a worldwide recognition um of things that need to, that of the kinds of transformative change that need to happen to create solutions to the climate emergency solutions to the covid pandemic solutions to biodiversity loss, solutions to the worldwide inequality, you know, they're all connected. Um, and I think the possibilities for transformative change remain open, but we must all act now. And what has to be done different then this time? If we're going to, as you say, seize this opportunity, is it about political will? Is it about better prioritization of our financial resources, our, our human power? Like, what has been missing up until now? Like, what have we done wrong? What do we need to do more of, would you say? Um, I think what's been missing has been leadership, frankly. Um, we need leadership for that change, for transformative change requires transformative leadership. And that, I think, is what we're looking for. Um, I was at the COP just for one day, at COP26, and was thinking before I went about who we can look to within the world for, for, for leadership towards the change that's needed to address the climate emergency. And, the, you know, the leadership we have is emanating from an 18-year-old Swedish woman, which is astonishing, and how, how wonderful that, that she is a voice um, that has created change and created some leadership, but but that doesn't fill the political vacuum at the top of, of what, what's needed for the change we need. I was thinking in the UK the other day, because I'm working on a report about the impact of COVID on children in the North. Who's a champion within England for, for child poverty and, and for us addressing those? Who I can ask to write a preface for that report? Mm. Um, and the leadership on child poverty in the UK at the moment is coming from a footballer mm. who is bold and willing to speak out and hold government to account. Well, where are our political leaders mm. for climate change, for child well-being, for um, different economic systems, for addressing the pandemic problems? And I don't think I don't think we're seeing the kind of charismatic, bold leadership that we need that the people who are willing to paint the visions of the different kinds of ways we need to move forward so i think i think that's the biggest thing we're lacking actually is leadership and political leadership in particular and i think we'll come back to this theme in our q a of transformative leadership you obviously do a lot of work in the area of thought leadership research but you're also involved in a number of projects i wonder can you just give us a little flavor for for some of them that you're uh, involved in that are addressing this whole area of inequality which is born in bradford and act early and how are these i guess projects addressing everything we've just talked about inequality and disadvantage yes yeah, so a lot of my research at the moment focuses on um the children and families in Bradford, which is a deprived city in the north of England. And what we're trying to create in that city is systems change for child well-being and development. So not thinking about what happens to children in isolation within particular sectors, you know, not thinking about the health sector divorced from the education sector or not thinking about those things divorced from, from social work, but really trying to think about how the whole system 
needs to work together to create positive change for children. Now that takes quite a long time and it, it requires um, relationships of trust and it requires good data. Um, but it mostly, yeah, it mostly requires people working together towards a common goal and thinking about how, if you want to shift the dial, for instance, on teenage pregnancies or child obesity or child asthma, how does the system need to change and how, how do we create change that, that is resilient? And I think the reason we've made progress in Bradford and we have made some really, really positive progress around children's health has been because clinicians work with counsellors, work with social work, work with schools, um, and, and it's joined up cross-sectoral, interdisciplinary and forward-looking. And is that the kind of systemic change that you've seen modelled in other countries? I know back again 2009 when you wrote Spirit Level, you were very much looking to Japan, Scandinavian countries as the ones that were kind of the, the shining light, the lighthouse of, of best practices and examples. So are there countries still today, did they actually, to your mind, retain that? And are there other countries Ireland should be looking to as best in class? Uh, it's interesting, isn't it, because there's no perfect place. There's nowhere that's doing it all right. But there are lots of different places that are getting some of it mm -hmm. right or some of it better. Um, I've been so impressed, actually, with the devolved um, governments in the UK, as Scotland and Wales in particular, in the way they're thinking about children's futures and future generations and in the way they're prioritising well-being over gross domestic product growth, for example. Um, and they're not alone in the world. There is an alliance of governments called um, We Go. That's the Wellbeing Economy Government that in includes New Zealand and Ireland um, and others. So, so there are places you can look to um, that are doing things right. There are countries in the global south that are getting things right around sustainability. Costa Rica is a notable example. So it's not so much that we would look to one place and see everything happening there that's amazing. But I think we can think about looking at different places and learning lessons from the Scandinavian countries about how they do equality, from the Dutch about how they do child well-being, um, from New Zealand about how they handle the pandemic, from Korea as well. So we, we should be picking elements and just thinking somewhere out there in the world, someone's getting this right. So let's, let's go and find out who's getting it right, where they're getting it right, and learn those lessons. And are they getting it right, Kate? Because when it boils down, I remember you writing, I pulled out spirit level last night, as I said, and you wrote uh, with your colleague, the more equally wealth is distributed, the better the health of that society. And you went on to write, the problems in rich countries are not caused by society not being rich enough, but by the scale of material differences between people within society being too big. Like, is that still something you profoundly believe when we talk about that transformative leadership? This is societal change. This is all of us better understanding the impacts of inequality, disadvantage, and ultimately understanding that why and feeling a certain responsibility at all levels of society. Absolutely. If you tackle inequality, and that's not just about levelling up from the bottom, it is about levelling down too you create not just a fairer distribution of wealth, but you create trust and you create um, shared agendas and you create better well-being for almost everybody, you know, for the vast majority of the population. Um, you do better for children, you do better for ethnic minorities, you do better for women. Um, everybody benefits from living in a more equal society. And that kind of... Um, shared trust that improved social capital that sense that we're all in it together that will help us tackle all the problems that we face mm. not just one of them but 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 all of them because tackling inequality um, improves the quality of relationships throughout society mm. and it gives us it gives us the capacity to act collectively and to want to do that and to to look out for one another as well as for ourselves I think often we should be asking about what works, you know, what works to unleash greater, uh, to, to amplify the kinds of things we want to do. And reducing inequality really works. Mm. And it works across numerous kinds of outcomes and it works for all kinds of people. And so I see it as a sort of a, a, a core thing that we can do 
that will unleash a huge amount of benefit. Yeah, yeah, for everyone. Thank you for those introductory m remarks, Kate. We're going to broaden this out now to our panellists. Everybody at home dialing in or from offices around the country, reminder, do post across social using the hashtag Fair Futures. If you want to get a question into any of our speakers uh, between now and three o'clock, just head down to that little speech bubble at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. We're monitoring all of your questions and feedback here in real time. Now, we're joined by Bernie Laverty here in studio. Bernie is the manager of the area based childhood program in Tuzla, the child and family agency. The program is part of Tuzla's commitment to prevention and early intervention and the ABC program is delivered in communities around Ireland which experience a high level of disadvantage. Emer Smith, welcome Emer, is a research professor at the Economic and Social Research Institute, better known as the ESRI and Emer's research work has focused on educational inequality in particular and Emer is principal investigator on the well-known Growing Up in Ireland research project. You're very welcome Emer, Bernie now to join the conversation. Bernie I might come to you first. Um, Kate painted a, a picture there really of the 12 years travelled, what this pandemic has looked like globally right down to then projects in Bradford. Can you give us a feel of what the pandemic has looked like on the ground in places like Dublin here in Ireland. Thank you and, and so much that, that Kate covered there. I suppose in, in terms of what the last 19 months have looked like kind of locally is similar to what Kate has talked about in terms of Bradford or other areas of deprivation. We know kind of pre-pandemic that children living in consistent or relative poverty their outcomes are already were quite challenged. We know that poverty impacts kind of not just in the short term, but long term impacts in terms of social, emotional health, um, educational achievement, well-being. So as Kate said, we know that the communities that were already most at risk are those that actually have been impacted more. So as a community, those, those communities are going to be further impacted for, for a very long time. And one of the things Kate talked about as well, I thought was quite interesting, was the difference between our experience as adults of almost two years of this to children. So children who are four now have almost had half of their lives living in this pandemic. Children of 10 have lived 20% of their life with the pandemic. But locally, I suppose what we have found as well is one of the biggest challenges and biggest impacts was the loss of education. So we know in areas of disadvantage, education provides not just educational outcomes, but actually is a real support and buffer. You know, children quite often in, in, in DESH schools will be getting their, their hot school means. There, there's relationships, there's social attachment, there's the homeschool community liaison teachers. There's a whole network of support that schools bring, and that was lost in an instance. Now, we know there was fantastic interagency work on the ground with the homeschool teachers, with community um, CFSNs, ABC projects, Vincent de Paul, all working together to kind of respond to that immediate need when the pandemic came in terms of food poverty. One, one of the other areas, and, and I know the, the, I think in a couple of days' time, you're looking at the digital divide. So obviously, after a while, schools did get up and running online. But the reality is that for many children and families living in areas where ABC operate, don't have the access to the phones or the computers. So many children actually weren't able to access education in a way that other children were. Some communities, particularly traveller communities, just didn't have that, that um, access to the um, digital resources at all. So they've lost out further again as well. Um, so we know that many of the families that we would work with are, are not either in employment or in very low incomes. And those are the, the families as well that probably have been hardest, hardest hit by this. So I think that the lack of the educational supports, the lack of friendships, the lack of actually connecting with people. We also know that many of our families, that, and I think um, Kate mentioned this as well, already were living in quite difficult circumstances, maybe where there's domestic violence. We know that the rates of domestic violence incidents have, have risen as well when there's not been those other social supports. So the communities that we work with in ABC already were facing very, very poor outcomes. And I think as a result of the pandemic, that that's become even a bigger challenge. Yeah, the, the gap has widened yeah. even further. Emer, to bring you in, Kate talked beautifully earlier about getting the stories and the statistics, and that's how really you amplify the why. That's how you persuade and make this a, a key priority issue, particularly for policymakers and the transformative leaders that Kate talked about. Can you talk a little bit about just 
how important research and data is in this whole area in ensuring that you know you have good informed policy that can be iterative that can react in real time but but having that baseline I mean, I think Kate's point about stories was really important, and it's very much about the narrative. Um, you know, as, as researchers, we can often be accused of, of stating the obvious, but sometimes the obvious needs to be stated, and sometimes we're quite surprised by our research findings. So if we want to look at inequality or disadvantage, we need to know about the scale of that disadvantage in a particular setting, so in Ireland as opposed to Britain. We need to know which groups are suffering. We need to know, using longitudinal data like growing up in Ireland and, and born in Bradford, we need to know what are the risk and protective factors. What helps people avoid difficult outcomes? What poses greater risks of moving into poverty and poor outcomes? And then we also know, need to know what interventions by the state are working or not working or could work differently. So I think it's very important. We can draw some lessons from other contexts, but uh, it, it's really important to know, you know, to have Irish data that can look at which of the groups in Ireland, because we had a very different response in many ways uh, to the pandemic. In, in England, for example, the emphasis was on the furlough, whereas in Ireland, we saw much greater job loss. Um, but at the same time, the pandemic <coughs> unemployment payments did a good job of cushioning, uh, and it, it was set at a very high a rate relative to some some of, of the, the jobs. But we saw really high uh, job loss among young people. So as well as talking about the disruption to learning among young people, some people actually experienced a double whammy because they were in college, uh, in university, but they were also working part time. So they, their learning was disrupted and they lost their job. And Emer, building on that, we know through ESRI reports through the years that this generation, you know, had to deal with the recession coming out of 2008 and everything that came from that in terms of education, uh, the workforce. We know young people were really dis disenfranchised. We're seeing that again. Now. Is there any key takeaways that you're already seeing coming through in the research about just how children, young people are being impacted in what really is this double whammy in, in their lifetimes between recession and pandemic? Well, as, as Bernie indicated, we've seen very significant impact on, on learning and we've seen greater learning loss among the more disadvantaged groups who don't have access to digital devices, but also don't have parents who know the system in a way that can help support their children through it. But we also have seen a really heavy socio-emotional impact. Um, we did a special survey of the growing up in our Ireland cohort of 22-year-olds in December of last year. And we had seen more or less a doubling of the proportion who were above the threshold for depressive symptoms in the two years since they had been 20. So the real risk is that we will see a scarring effect, a long-term scarring effect. If the resources aren't put into that, we always already have problems about child and adolescent and adult mental health services prior to the pandemic. So it's a real issue because we know from other studies that have been done internationally, which have looked at the impact of 9-11 or Hurricane Katrina, that you can see effects on children and young people for several years to come. And this is a much more prolonged period of uncertainty and stress. Um, Kate, to bring you back in and to our audience, keep your questions coming. Just go to the speech bubble, bottom right-hand corner. Uh, we have one audience question, and Kate, it's for you. Would Kate have any comment on the Ipsos MORI Global Trends 2021 report cited by Vinton O'Toole? Uh, there's a long link there. You won't have time to read it. But basically, it is showing relatively strong support in Ireland for the statement, and the statement is... Having large differences in income and wealth is bad for society overall. And that had us coming fifth after Brazil, China, Germany and India in 13 listed countries. Thoughts there, Kate? Sorry, are you saying you came fifth in Ireland in thinking that was a bad thing? It says it's in... showing relatively strong support in Ireland for the statement. So we, we can probably uh, uh, click on that link behind the scenes here and get you a little bit more detail. Great. Where, where so exactly like we're it... come, but that, that's what's stated here, <laughs> coming fifth. But we know strong support for that statement. Having large differences in income and wealth is bad for society overall. That's excellent. And of course, having 
um, strong support for that kind of thing is a necessary first step, I think, in, in, in creating the change. But, you know, that's, it's been true for a long time that most people's intuition is that inequality is a bad thing. They think it's not good. They would like their governments to do something about it. It's true in Ireland. It's true, true in the UK. It's true, true in m most countries. Um, but then people sort of feel unsure about, well, what's the best way to tackle it or, or what happens? So sometimes they'll say, yes, we really want there to be um, smaller differences, but we don't want to pay more taxes. And so, so, so sometimes there's a disconnect between um, people's support for particular statements and their support for the kinds of actions that might tackle them. But the recognition of inequality as a problem is growing and is widespread, and that is a necessary first step to tackling change. Um, can I respond to something Eva said? I was thinking she spoke so eloquently about problems facing children and young people both before and after the pandemic, but the pandemic's knocking some things out of the way, don't you think, Ima? I mean, before the pandemic, I think there was a lot of discussion about the changing world of work for our young people. You know, what, what employment's going to look like for them in the future, and there were concerns about the automation of certain kinds of roles and um, the, the rise of the gig economy and the unstable job, and discussions that were really important have suddenly gone away over the past years and yet the situation hasn't changed and so that the the future for our young people was was looking disturbingly grim and difficult before covid and now covid kind of exacerbated that but some of those problems aren't being named so much in in public discourse anymore I think a big aspect in Ireland and in uh, urban Ireland in particular is the issue around housing and very significant housing costs. Um, we saw when we surveyed the 20 year olds and growing up in Ireland that, you know, a very high proportion, even compared to Britain, are, are still living in the parental home well into their 20s. There are significant rent costs and barriers to getting mortgage. So I think those issues possibly haven't been talked about. Yeah, it's, it's a bit slightly different in Ireland in that zero hours contracts are technically illegal. So, so the, the labour market regulation framework is a little bit different, but, but there are still problems about insecure jobs and so on. But, but what isn't talked about so much is all the young people who are leaving school and leaving university and other forms of, of uh, full-time education and how they make the transition to employment in such an uncertain uh, labour market. And like all organisations, DSRI, we've had people start and they have never met their colleagues in person. They haven't yeah. even been into the building and so on. So I, I think we haven't really fully recognised all that young people have had to cope with. To bring you back in, Bernie, and one thing I'm conscious of today is to make sure before three o'clock that not only do we really understand the full impact uh, and understand some of the good initiatives that are being done, but that we're talking about what else, what more. As Emer talked there about the long-term scarring effect, what occurs to you when it comes to like more training, more resources, but also just systemically, you know, Kate talked about just how systems work and collaborate together rather than sometimes compete. Like, what would you like to see more being done? Yeah, and, and Kate talked very well around kind of clinicians working with their local counsellors, working with parents, working with teachers. And that is some of the work that the Area Based Childhood Programme is involved in, in terms of kind of service delivery at, at, at an area based level. And one of the areas we have been working on, which again I think is going to be deeply impacted by the pandemic, is around, um, as well as social and emotional skills, is around language and literacy. So we know that in areas of disadvantage, up to 50% of children kind of entering primary school already have a speech, language and communication difficulty. And the waiting list for primary care, speech and language therapy pre-pandemic were already two to three years. So children are entering kind of the educational system without the skills or the language to fully utilise, which will then impact on their ability to really achieve within school and obviously a long term impact on that. So one of the areas of work the ABC programme has been involved in, there's quite a lot of speech and language therapists work in the ABC programme, but they work very much in partnership with parents and partnerships with schools and early learning and care centres. So there's one particular programme called the Talkbus programme, 
and it's a programme that is aimed at children with um, a, a language delay. So rather than waiting for a long time to see a speech and language therapist, the, the speech and language therapist from ABC will train up the early years educators and the teachers to deliver this targeted programme to children um, in groups of six. It's a fantastic outcome in terms of a nine week intervention, actually raises children's language and communication by six months. So there's examples of that where while we're waiting for some of the specialist um, supports, the teachers, parents, early learning and care educators can actually be working together to, to, to um, deliver those services to children great example uh, and keep questions coming from our audience as I say go to the speech bubble down the right hand corner um, I'm going to come back to some audience questions one here from Bridget Kate I'll direct this to you but anyone else jump in on it um, appreciating that it's not either or but would the panel think that mitigating the effects of income equality is paramount or is there a need to ensure actual income equality as well or would increasing incomes have a bigger effect Kate you might kick that one off for us I know it's a big one <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I think there's two ways. There's two ways of creating greater equalities of, of, of wealth and income. Um, two main ways. And one is through redistribution, as I think the questioner is, is indicating. Um, and the other, of course, would be having smaller differences to start with by either increasing um, low pay at the bottom and making sure that we haven't got um, sectors of the economy where, where low pay is disadvantaging people um, or having um, greater forms of economic democracy, meaning that we're not allowing sort of those runaway top salaries at the top. So you can either try and do it through sort of taxes, redistribution, um, spending on welfare, or you can try and have smaller income differences to start with. I think both are important and it's definitely a question of wanting to have my cake and eat, and, and, and <laughs> yes. eat it. Um, um, but I think long term, we are, we are in the income inequality context that we're in today because we have not paid enough attention to income differences at the point at which they're earned more than because we've not paid attention to, to redistribution and we have allowed ridiculous growth in top salaries, bonuses, you know, a culture where some people are seen to be worth hundreds of thousands time more than others and so other people's labor is, is poorly recompensed and that, that needs fixing I think because that changes the culture around incomes and the value of work. I mean, throughout the pandemic, we have come to see the value of the contributions that people make to society who aren't particularly well paid. Um, the people who kept our health services running, the people who kept the schools um, going and the education programs as best they could, the people who kept our supermarket shelves stocked and cleaned the streets and kept taking away the rubbish. And at first, we were all um, standing out on the street and clapping for them and, and showing how much we appreciated the contributions that they made. And quite quickly, that, that seems to have vanished again. And we're not giving people, you know, the kinds of pay settlements that, that really should be seen. And we need to try and remember that. We need to try and remember that all of the ways in which people contribute to society are valuable. Yeah. And we need to do something better about how we reward those tasks and don't over specialize as a society or don't over reward certain kinds of contribution um covid showed us how valuable caring is and covid showed us how valuable cleaning is and covid showed us how how valuable catering is and covid showed us how valuable all these things were that we, we've perhaps taken for granted and thought were not sectors of the economy that, that needed respect mm -hmm. and recognition and recompensing properly um, so I, I would like us to see see us paying a lot more attention to how we think about how we value all the different kinds of contributions that keep our economy and our society moving and functioning and that we don't think that being a wizard finance 
is worth a whole lot more than being really good at talking to people or helping people, looking after people. Thank you for that, Kate. Question for you, Bernie. Given the crisis over the past two years, what has this meant for prevention and early intervention? Um, I suppose the focus has been in the immediate crisis, and I suppose that is always the challenge for prevention and early intervention, is that there's something that is a crisis at this moment that needs resourced and funded. But all the research and evidence shows us that putting supports in at that early stage actually does pay dividends. So I think the pandemic will show us again that if we are to get away from kind of the individualising of poverty, but look at the systemic structure that causes poverty, is we need to be equally investing in prevention and early intervention. So I think it, it shows us that we need it even more than now, but I suppose the cost of COVID potentially means that money again will be kind of re-diverted and kept at that crisis level and not adequate funding put into prevention and early intervention, unfortunately. Okay. Uh Lots and lots of audience questions. Ema, I have two I'm going to group together for you. One from Gronje. How do you tell stories about child poverty without poverty shaming individual children or families? That's one, and that might be something... Sorry, others. Anya, I'm having problems hearing you. Oh, I'll repeat that one again. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfectly. Okay, great. Thanks. So that first one from Gronje was, how do you tell stories about child poverty without poverty shaming individual children or families? That's one, Ema. And I'm going to link on a second one, and this is from Francis, who says... To what extent do we have an understanding of the long-term impact of childhood adversity and poverty across the life course in Ireland? Is more research needed to increase the depth of our understanding as opposed to relying on findings from other countries? Okay, that, they're great questions. I'll start with the second one first. Um, we have done work to date which has looked at whether um, cumulative recurrent periods of poverty have a greater impact than once off or temporary poverty because we actually have cohorts of children and young people many of whom about four and ten experienced at least one spell of economic vulnerability because of the recession and we do see that kind of that recurrent or persistent exposure to poverty has an impact on all outcomes it could be education it could be health socio-emotional well-being and so on so far we haven't been able to track uh, young people into full adulthood, but we are. We have information going up to 20, so we can capture um, that, that impact. And as they move into even middle age and old age, as, as growing up in Ireland gets older, we will know more and be able to be more specific than we can be by just making inferences from, from other data in other countries. I think it's an interesting point about stories about child poverty without kind of poverty shaming and I, I think it is very much about the narrative that you tell and, and I think what yes or I work and other work has shown is that we talk about well the way in which children's circumstances reflect the family into which they're born and and the the di differences in resources to which they have access and I think if you put the lens back on, on the child and the young person and you talk about what they they are able to do or are prevented uh, from doing because of lack of resources i think it, it shifts it it certainly wouldn't be the case um that anything that we have focused on would be uh, uh, really about blaming the parents in that in any way in fact the growing up in ireland's um uh, research has shown that while you know what parents do in terms of home learning and so on is very important it doesn't explain the inequalities so there are inequalities in uh, that remain uh, that have to do with parents education and parents income that are direct effects uh, they're not just because you know middle class parents reach their children more mm -hmm. and i think it's important that we don't kind of engage in that sort of deficit perspective what we find across the board is that parents have really high hopes and expectations for their children yeah. uh, even those who who wouldn't have gone further than the junior cert over half of them expect their child to go on to other, higher education in ireland but it's, it's the resources to get there is, is what makes the difference. It's, it's not a poverty of aspirations. It's it's a poverty of resources. Yeah, so well Can I just come in there, yeah, Anya? Of course, Bernie. Just in terms of that voice of the lived experience for children, um, just to reference a piece of work that CDI, Childhood Development Initiative, in Tala did recently, and that was actually talking to children, young people and families about their experience of poverty in Tala. 
And I think it's really important to hear that voice. And obviously, it's really important that that's respectfully done with people that, that have that relationship with children. But actually, much of our debate in child poverty is from an adult centric point of view. And I think it's really important going forward that we do listen to that voice. Children know what it's like to live in poverty. They can name what are the things they don't have. So I think going forward as policymakers, as practitioners, we need to really seek that voice. Um, and not be afraid, because I think there is that stigma that sometimes as practitioners we're worried about if we talk about poverty to children who are in poverty, mm -hmm. that that causes stigma. But the reality is children and families know when yeah. they're living in poverty, it's, and I think we need yeah. to get more of that voice yeah. heard. Plum for honesty and transparency, yeah. Question from Mary here. Uh, Kate, I'll direct this one to you. Um, so, Kate, it's titled Getting Out of Silos, and Mary says, some good examples of working across administrative silos. Hospital group in Toronto, or I think you're supposed to say Toronto when I've been there, built whole <laughs> systems approach, which means doctors can now prescribe housing as a health intervention. It takes a long time to build relationships of trust, yet reorganisation, so when we think about NHD, HSE, constant uh, interrupts relationships by casting people in new stroke newish roles. And Miri asks, how can we stop the compulsion to restructure as a solution? Oh, I'll take that last one first. Yeah, restructuring is, is, is often like, well, it means you, you try and fix things that aren't broken, actually. Um, we're always doing it in the UK, aren't we? We always restructure our health service nearly. It never really gets anywhere. I, I do think all of this systems change is, is difficult and challenging, and it often requires culture change. That, that's the thing. To get us out of silos often requires professionals and policymakers to think and work in new ways. Um, and that's not comfortable, and it does take time. Um, and so, so there are no quick fixes here, and certainly not by, by throwing everything up and just, just reorganizing everything. But when we're thinking about um, improving things for children, I think if we put them first, if we put them first and center, then we can start to think about what is in their best interest, what, what, what are the best ways we could work. And we need to sort of free up our imaginations, I think, to not just throw everything up in the air and try and change it all, but think about what changes could be positive. COVID threw a lot of things up in the air, actually. COVID forced a lot of changes. Um, professionals working together who hadn't worked together before. Um, institutions and organizations working together in ways they hadn't worked before. Institutions and organizations working faster and breaking their own rules and changing things because they suddenly had to and realizing that they could have done it all along. So, so I think there's real possibilities there. But we do need the evidence base for what we do. And we don't always have it when it comes to interventions for children. We know, as Ema has said so, so eloquently, we know what the risk factors are. We know what makes people vulnerable and not. And we know what some of the positive factors are that cre create resilience when it comes to interventions we often don't know much or we only know about them in a different place and whether they work there or not which isn't helpful and what we often don't know is how they work together so we don't know we might know that um, an intervention for early childhood has been effective in one trial in one place in the world we don't know if it'll work in our place and we don't know how to work if we add something onto it or take something away from it, or adapt it a bit. So we don't have a lot of real world evidence. And that means that we need to be building that evidence base as we make the changes, um, and making sure that changes that we make are evaluated properly so that we don't keep doing them if they don't work. And we do often put things in place that don't work. Um, and we need to be humble enough to admit that and to, to, to adapt and to change as we go along. But it does also mean thinking about what, what are the kinds of evidence that are useful to us. And sometimes it's not the old fashioned um, randomized control trial of a single intervention. It is more real world evidence of, well, if a family gets this intervention and they go to see that practitioner and they're referred to this, does that package of stuff help? And we're not very good at that yet, but we will get we will get better. I think, at looking at groups of interventions, stacked interventions, pathways through different kinds of services and interventions, 
and understanding what, what's, what's optimal for people. We'll get better at it. Great. Thanks, Kate. Emer, do you want to come in there and that whole outline there about long, uh, about the, the interventions and the real world evidence and what works in one country and trying to understand then, can this be localised and personalised like to a country I, like Ireland? I, I think that's that's really important at, at both a macro and national level and at a smaller level. Uh, I, I think I was one of the few people that didn't have a study visit to Finland when they were doing extremely well in Pisa. In Pisa. And there was this real feeling at the time that oh, we could just take what they're doing and put it here. But that was t completely abstracted from, say, the much lower levels of income inequality in Finland, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the broader societal context. So I think that's one aspect. And I think there is a risk sometimes that we can take things off the shelf that were developed in America or, or somewhere else and say, oh, they will work here without taking account of the fact that we have very specific education system, a very specific, uh, you know, labor market system and so on. I think we can learn, as, as David Rafe uh, used to talk about policy learning, where we re refresh our thinking by looking at other examples, but reflect them through the lens of our own practice. But I think what Kate was saying about not knowing very much about the impact of interventions, I think it's particularly the case when you talk about more disadvantaged groups, because they experience an awful lot of contact with the state. And they're subject to an awful lot of different kinds of interventions. And we haven't been very good about kind of disentangling those and saying, well, you know, are, are some of them working in different ways or actually counterproductive ways to others and so on. And, and we haven't taken that, that more holistic view of looking at interventions. Okay, great. Thanks, Emer. I'm conscious we have only have uh, five minutes left, but we'll try and get through a few question, questions very quickly. To come back to you, Bernie, a uh, question here from John Tusla. After two years of disrupted education, some young people are leaving school at 16 to take up employment in apprenticeships, hospitality, retail. When is the Education Welfare Board going to implement the Education Act in respect of the register of young people in employment to ensure that young people in work receive training? And I have to say, I'm not able to answer that That's question okay. in terms of I'm working with intervention and That's early okay. intervention. So, uh, Emer might be able to answer Emer, that, that more one than for I you? could. Otherwise, well, and I don't know is okay. <laughs> it, 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 has, it has been a long-standing issue, uh, certainly that, you know, there's a gap there for, for those young people who are legally entitled to leave school, but who by leaving before the end of senior cycle are impacting on their long-term life chances and increasing their their, their uh, chances of unemployment and poverty okay thank you for that Emer. bernie this might be one for you but others jump in as well um susan asks can the panel discuss what the boundaries and uh, boundaries might be barriers i think here in this case are for families in accessing the services and support which do exist how can services and systems change this to genuinely deliver no wrong door yeah, and I think there's a lot of work happening as well to look at, you know, there are a number of really good services, not just across ABC, other TUSLA and, and non-governmental organisations. A lot of them are situated within Dublin and the urban areas as well, where obviously there's a lot of child poverty in rural areas. So I think there is that that issue around equitable access to those services beyond, beyond the urban areas. <clears throat> And again, we know that traveller families quite often are not accessing supports in a way that that happens as well. I suppose the setup of the ABC programme is we've 12 ABCs and they're in areas of very high social disadvantage. But when we deliver a lot of the services, they're not targeted services. They're universal services within target areas, which actually enhances the uptake from some of those harder to engage communities into, into those services. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Bernie. Um, I'll take one. Let me see. We might squeeze in one more question before I'm going to ask each of you to think about some w w words of wisdom or maybe a call to action you want to leave everybody with today. And Alice uh, asks, and so put your hand up for this one, but Alice asks, should we be investing in promoting community development, um, these bottom-up approaches more in this country? Anyone want to jump in there quickly? Bottom-up approaches, that's where we should be funding, investing. Emer, Kate, Bernie? I, I think, yes, we always need the bottom-up in community development, but also I think, as, as people have talked about around the silos and government, there's many different approaches, I think, that are needed to really tackle child poverty and that intergenerational poverty. 
Very good. Well, thank you to our audience. Those questions were just absolutely wonderful, and I hope everybody really benefited from hearing what, what your colleagues across frontline services, academia, NGOs were asking there. Uh, before we close out, we're going to do some thank yous and credits. I do want to come back to each of our speakers just to take 30 seconds, 60 seconds. We covered a lot of ground there from kind of really trying to diagnose the problem, understand the global impact, to then talking about some use cases, case studies, what's working, and also try and kind of signpost, okay, where to now? What are some of the other things we can do more of? Kate, is there any final words of wisdom or a call to action you'd like to leave us with? I think just keeping children at the centre, you would be surprised how many times at international, national, local level, I'm in arenas where people are talking about children, but actually children are not at the centre of what they're, what they're thinking about. Um, so keep, keep our eyes on the children. Yeah. Okay. Good sound advice. Emer, to you. One thing we haven't had a chance to talk about is the impact of the concentration of disadvantage at school level. Uh, we have done a good job of putting resources and supports in place through the DASH program, but I think we could go further by providing even more resources for those schools serving very disadvantaged populations. Okay, well said. Thank you, Emer. And Bernie, to you. I suppose encouraging kind of practitioners at the front line level to keep doing what they're doing, but also calling on government to move away from that non-adversarial non approach they have to everything. And as Kate says, to put children at the centre. And I think we all have a job to do to change the narrative on child poverty. Stop blaming the individual child, the individual family, the individual community, and actually see this as all of our issues that we okay. need to work with. Very well said by each of you. Thank you for that. Now, as this event comes to a close, you're going to receive an email um, shortly with a link to a just very, very short survey. It's really helpful to us here to get your feedback as we look ahead to the next three webinars in this series. So we'd really appreciate you just taking a couple of minutes to give us that feedback. As we mentioned, there are three more to come, one on Wednesday and then two next week. The next event on Wednesday at two o'clock, you can still register for it and all of the remaining events by going Going to whatworks.gov.ie forward slash festival hyphen of hyphen learning hyphen 20 2021. I'm sure if you just Google, you will find it that way as well. What Works Festival of Learning 2021, and you will find it. Our huge thanks to our speakers today, Professor Kate Pickett of University of York and co-author of The Spirit Level and The Inner Level, to Bernie Lafferty for joining us here in studio, National ABC Manager at Tusla, the Child and Family Agency, Emma Smith also joining us online, Research Professor at the ESRI. Our thanks also to our signer here, Bernadette Ferguson, what works, as we mentioned at the start, is an initiative designed by the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth with funding from dormant accounts. The department worked with CES, the Centre for Effective Services, in planning and delivering this series of webcasts. We look forward to welcoming you back here on Wednesday at 2 o'clock. Thanks so much for joining us.